everything that we struggle with, everything that we face, everything that life throws at us. There are certain things that we can stand on in those times. There are certain things that we can stand on when life is pressing down on us from all sides. And one of those things is God promises to us. God has made promises to us, and we can stand on those promises no matter what we feel like, no matter what things seem like, no matter what we see, no matter what we feel. Our hope can reside in those promises God has made in our life. If you believe that, go ahead. so many promises 
God's promises are never ending. And one of those promises is he, he tells us that he will bring life to something that is dead if we only allow him to. So I was doing, I was listening to a teaching this week and it was about when God was bringing Ezekiel through the valley of the dry bones. And you know, we all kind of go through those times in our lives where we go through our own valleys with our own dry bones, things that are, you know, feel dry, feel dead, whether it's in our relationships, our marriages, our jobs, whatever the situation might be. Sometimes we find ourselves in those dry places. And the Lord said to Ezekiel, I want you to prophesy to those bones. And I want you to tell them to live. And so Ezekiel's like, okay, God, I, I'm going to obey you. And, and Ezekiel prophesied to the bones. And he said to the bones what God told him to say. But there was still death. There was no life. And Ezekiel said, I, God, I, I, I did what you told me. You know, I prophesied to these bones. But, you know, a little bit happened, but nothing really changed. And God said, wait. You're not done. I'm not done. I want you to prophesy to the breath. It's the breath of God that brings the life. So this morning, as we sing this next song, I want you to take just a minute to think in your own life where your dry valley is, where your dry bones are lying. And as we sing this song, I want you to just speak life. I want you to prophesy over those areas and say no. You will come to life because the breath of God gives them life. Amen. Amen.
of what it says in Romans chapter 4, speaking of God, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into beings that which were not. It's exactly what my mom was just talking about with that example in Ezekiel, you know, the valley of the dry bones. He prophesied and it, it had the appearance of being alive, but wait, it was not. It was still dead. But because the breath of the Lord came and brought that brought brought life. There may be areas in each in your heart and in your life where in some aspects the Lord has made you alive, but there's still areas that you are still dead inside. Hopes that are dead because of whatever. Dreams, um, whatever the case may be, that it because of life, because of the world, because of our fallen nature, it, it, it's it's just bones wrapped with skin. There's no breath of life in it. But the word says that God has the ability to give life to the dead and calls into being things which were not. So, Father, we we take hold of that promise, Lord, and we surrender those areas, those there's deep places in our heart that we don't expose to you sometimes or we don't share with others. Lord, we, we give those to you this morning and take hold of your promise that says that you bring life to the things that are dead and call into being that which was not. We take hold of that promise and proclaim like Pastor L.A. in the song that we sang, your promises. It doesn't matter what I see. It doesn't matter what I feel. My hope will always be, our hope will always be in your promises and in your word. And we give you all the praise and all the glory and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome everybody this morning. To life fun. We are so excited to have you with us here this morning. If this is your first or second time here, we would love to connect with you. And one of the great ways that we, at least the great way we think to do that is by filling out one of our connection cards. You can find them in the seats in front of you. Go ahead and take it out. You can fill it out and take it back to our Life Center after service. And we got a free t-shirt for you. At this time, we're going to go ahead and take of our tithes and our offerings. And for those of you who may be here for the first or second time, this is by no charge, no this is no charge or anything to be here, no entry fee or some covered charge. We believe here, this is for those that call Lifeline home, but we believe what the word says. We believe that the Bible is true and that when we are faithful to return to the Lord what is his, that first 10%, we believe that he will be faithful to provide all of our needs. Amen. He is our Jehovah Jireh. So at Lifeline, we have several ways that you can give. If you feel so led, you can give as the ushers go ahead and make their way around with the baskets. You can give, um, online at lifelinelode.com. You can also text to give, a real easy way to do that by texting the number there on the screen. Or we also have a giving box located in the back by the double doors. You can give that way as well. Also, Growth Track 301 is happening today after, well, our second service. This is our second service at 1230. So for those of you who have been coming for a few times and kind of want to learn a little bit more about who we are, what we're all about, or you've been coming for a while and you really like what you see and you want to get involved and plugged into our awesome dream team, Growth Track is your opportunity to do that. So it'll be happening right after service at 12.30. Child care is provided and then the light lunch as well. So, And also, in your bulletins this morning, you should have received a little flyer for Encounter. I'm really excited for Encounter. Anybody know what Encounter is? Probably not. I will tell you, it is an opportunity that we're going to be having next Sunday to encounter the Lord through corporate worship. How many of you know that there is something powerful and significant when the body of Christ comes together to pursue the Lord. You know, the word says that if you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. And so that's exactly what we're going to do next Sunday, right here at the Lifeline building at 6.30 p.m. So if you want to encounter the Lord in a deeper way, you're feeling those dry, dead areas inside and you need a touch from the Lord, come to encounter. Or if you're fresh and new in your walk with Jesus and you're just on fire and you want more, and come to encounter. So that'll be happening next Sunday at 6.30 right here in our main service building. So with that, go ahead and stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. And go ahead and give two to three people a high five around you and tell them that you love them and they look lovely this morning.
was not the one that you would have chosen when you're at the end of your rope and you're holding on but feel like you see, you're I almost felt left, left out right there but I got one it's after all man we, we all need high fives don't you know that you tried all right all right all right you saw light, then you lost it. wow you guys are just happy to be here huh I can tell right now you guys are so excited, and that is that is great with us. We feel like church should be an exciting place to be. We just believe that uh, when they were, they, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go to the house of the Lord. I'm glad when someone said, hey, let's go to church. I'm happy about it. Come on now. Man, church, church don't need to be like that. Church don't need to be like, oh, well. Don't need to be like that. It doesn't need to be like that. But before we get started, before we go into the message, I just want to do uh, one thing, and I want to let you know about something. And I need all the men in the house to give me a hearty hoorah. That was way better than first service. Wow. Wow. But I think you can do better because that was on the edge of girliness. Let me hear the men say, hoorah. hoorah. That was pretty nice. See, we're going to have a lot of that. Oh, the ladies are like cheering for you right now. Doesn't that feel good, man? Doesn't that feel good? Uh, we're going to be doing men's camp from May 4th through May 6th. It is going to be amazing. We've got David Carr, going to be one of our keynote speakers over there. We've got steak for dinner pretty much every night. Oh, my goodness. It costs about $159 to go, which is about as much as it costs to feed you anyways for three days. So you're pretty much breaking even. It is going to be amazing. We've got axe throwing. We've got shooting range. We've got powerful and dynamic men's speakers to speak directly into. Oh, that, was, that broke my heart a little bit. To speak directly into where men are in their lives. So all of us men are, are definitely going to benefit from all of this. But I want to say before I stop talking about men's camp, I have to tell you that it does cost $159 to go. But if the money is the only issue, I would love for you to come tell me. Everybody see me? Say yes if you see me. Yes, you can all see me. If, if money's the only issue, come and see me. Uh, thank God for, for good, godly tithers. We've got a bunch of tithers in this church. So we have money to help with things like this. It's a beautiful system that God set up. So if money is your issue, please come and let me know. I don't want that to be the only issue standing in your way from coming to this powerful event that has life-changing life -changing potential in your life. So what we're also going to do, Joe, come on up. Give Joe a round of applause. I always have people clap whenever anybody comes onto this platform because it's scary. So when you clap for it, it makes it easier. But we're going to pray over the offering right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you right now for, for every dollar given. Lord, we pray that you would stretch it and, and use it in a mighty way so that we can start recovery centers in this community, so that we can uh, create even new venues to have worship experience just like this. Lord, use these kingdom dollars to reach men and women with the love of Jesus. I just pray a blessing over this offering and the people who gave in Jesus' name. Come on, everyone said, amen. amen. Thank you, Joe. Now I have the privilege of introducing to you Pastor Tiffany, who's going to come and blow your socks off from the Word of God. Come on, give it up for her. Good morning, everyone. So good to be with you all this morning. It's almost afternoon now, the 11 o'clock. It's like lunchtime, uh, but it's still good. so good to be with you all. You all. Uh, my name is Tiffany. He said that. My husband, Elliot, we have the honor and privilege. I messed up a word in the beginning. Haha, <laughs> funny. Anyway, the honor and privilege uh, of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. And we're so glad that you all are here this morning. We believe that God really does have a life giving message for you all. Come on, that's exciting. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, so I'm going to give you a moment to turn to our main scripture this morning. We're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. So if you brought your paper Bible, uh, which I love. I prefer my paper Bible because I like to highlight and take notes. And I can do that on my app, but I can't ever look back. You know, and I'm just like thumbing through my paper Bible. I'm like, oh, that's what God said to me, and it was so good. So paper Bible, go ahead, and if you don't know where Ecclesiastes is, no problem. Turn to the table of contents. It'll start with ECC, and then, you know, fill in the blanks and go find it. Uh, or it's on your YouVersion Bible app if you have that, and it'll also be up on the screens. Um, today we're in week two of our series on choices, and it's all about choosing the hard right over the easy wrong. That's right, choosing the hard right over the easy wrong. So there is a super easy wrong. We're going to talk about how we make the right choices. How do, how do we do that in our life? Um, 
And if you missed last week, you're probably going to want to go listen to that. I think Pastor Elliot did a dynamic job opening up this series on choices. Uh, my favorite takeaway from that uh, message, you can watch it live on Facebook. It won't be live anymore, but you can watch the recorded version. Um, was this idea of a cupcake. I don't know if you guys remember this. He said there's a difference between someone want, who wants to give you a cupcake because they love you and then someone wanting to give you a cupcake because you're on a diet. And on the outside, they both look good. It's a cupcake. But one was done with, with good intention and the other is done with an evil intent. And that can be transferred to today's topic, which is all about choosing the hard right over the easy wrong in our romantic relationships. Ready to have some fun, guys? <laughs> Choosing the hard right over the easy wrong in our romantic relationships. God gave us the cap capacity to be attracted to the opposite sex for our enjoyment. That cupcake he wants to give us is good, but the enemy will use that same gift from God to destroy us. And so we're going to talk about to making the right choices in order to win at life, to win in relationships, and to succeed. Because how many of you know that... Um, <clears throat> It seems like, this is, this is kind of funny, our relationships have this strange ability to impact every area of our life. You know what I'm talking about? If, you have a, if you're a parent and you're, you have a um, child relationship that's off, it seems like your day is off and your work life is off. If you're uh, at war with someone in your office at, at work, if that relationship is off, everything in your life seems off. Relationships have this funny way of drastically impacting everything that we do. And our romantic relationships are no different, whether that's a dating relationship or a marriage relationship. When those things are off or something's out of place, it affects every area in our life. And we want to help you win. We want to help you win in your relationships so that you're winning at the rest of life. Come on, you guys want to win. You want to win, huh? Yeah. Uh, so uh, there's a scripture talking about God giving us the capacity to be attracted to the opposite sex, but the enemy using that to destroy us. James says it like this in chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. It says, A man is tempted to do wrong when he lets himself be led by what his bad thoughts tell him to do. Everybody say bad thoughts. Bad thoughts. Uh, when he does what his bad thoughts, bad thoughts tell him to do, he sins. When sin completes its work, it brings death. Now, I sure hope you know this, and I, I truly believe that you do, but I, I just have to, I have to say it. Not every thought is a good thought. We have bad thoughts. You guys, you, guys, you guys should know this. Not all of your thoughts are good, which is going to lead us to our theme verse, which is found in 1 Corinthians, and it says this. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. So before we move on into the, the bulk of the message, I, I want to highlight two things. First, you are not alone. Uh, the person sitting next to you has had bad thoughts. And I'm not, you know, I said we we're going to talk about romantic relationships. So I'm not just talking about bad thoughts there. I'm talking about bad thoughts in your entire life. The person sitting next to you has had bad thoughts. We've all had them. Your kids are going to have bad thoughts. Your parents have had bad thoughts. You are not alone, which the enemy would like you to believe, okay? But you're not. Everybody has had bad thoughts. We live uh, in a fallen world, and we have a sin nature. And I need, to, I need to tell you guys this. Having a bad thought is not a sin. Okay, just because you had a bad thought, that doesn't mean you have sinned, which is what the enemy would like you to believe. You guys know what I'm talking about. You had a bad thought, and all of a sudden, it's like instantaneous shame surrounds you and guilt. And all of a sudden, like, you don't want to admit that you had this bad thought. Let me tell you, having the bad thought is not sin, and you are not alone. It doesn't become sin until you entertain that thought or you put action to it. So I need to tell you, don't let the enemy bring you down for having thoughts. Now, if you keep having repetitive thoughts, you need to do something about that. The Lord says, take captive every thought and make it obedient and subject to the authority of Christ Jesus, and he can set you free. So if it's a continual thought, well, that becomes a pattern and a habit and a stronghold in your life. But just to have one thought, that doesn't make it sin, and you're not alone there. You guys need to know that. Um, second, God is faithful. There is always a way out. God always provides a way out, and that's what we're talking about, choosing the hard right over the easy wrong. The way out is often harder than the way in, okay? Um, so our main text is going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, <clears throat> and it is Old Testament, but I promise you're going to be blessed this morning. So Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. 
It should also be up on the screens, and it says this, for everything, there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven. There's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to turn away, a time to search and a time to quit searching, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be quiet and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. And that is in a song somewhere, so you probably are familiar with that scripture even if you've never read it. Here's the main point for today. There is a season for everything, but all things do not belong in all seasons. I'm going to say it again. There's a season for everything, but all things do not belong in all seasons. So today we're going to look at three seasons. We're going to look at the, this is going to be fun. I know you guys are so excited. Uh, We're going to look at the pre-dating season. We're going to explain when we get there. We're going to look at the dating season, and then we're going to look at the marriage season. And I know you guys are like, hold on to your seats, because we don't talk about this in church very often. You came to church and you're like, oh no, can I get up and walk out (laughs) without being noticed? That's fine. That's fine. I want to say this, though. Um, The church doesn't often talk about it. And and what I want to be clear is we're in no, I am in no way passing judgment on what you do in your personal life. You need to know that. I need to let you know that the church is in no way passing judgment on your personal life and what you choose to do. Let me tell you about the person of Jesus. When Jesus walked on the earth, people flocked to him. They flocked to the person of Jesus because he was full of the spirit of the living God and he loved people and he told them the truth. And he said, this is what he said, if you hear my words and you respond to them and something is stirring in your heart, then I'm calling you out of the world. And if I've called you out of the world, then I've got a better way for you to live. I've got a way for you to win. Let me tell you something. What happens is as Christian people, we often put our, I've been called, let me, I've been called out of the world, and I believe that Jesus has a better way for me to live. And so I'm going to walk according to that. But it is not right for me to pass judgment on someone who has not given their life to Jesus Christ, who has not been called out of the world. And so if you don't feel like you've been called out of the world and you're not following Jesus, I'm not judging you. And this isn't supposed to pass judgment. It's saying Jesus wants you to win, and he's got a way for you to win. And the scripture itself says that God, did, Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. And he saved the world by loving people. He saved the world by offering hope. He saved the world by offering them another choice. And that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to talk about that other choice, but it is, we're not judging. There's no condemnation, but there is freedom and there is hope and there is wholeness. And there's a real way that we can win in our relationships. And so we're going to talk about that. First, uh, we're going to look at the pre, I'm going to say this, at Lifeline, we do want to increase your odds. I know you guys have all heard the statistics that so many marriages are failing and people don't even believe in marriage. Like it's outrageous what's happening in our, in our global world today, but we want to increase your odds. We want you to win in your marriage literally, seriously, absolutely, we want you to win in your marriage. And me and Elliot are like, I'm, we are 100% committed to seeing that marriage win and that marriage work because God wants it to win and God wants it to work. We want you to win in your dating relationships. We know people date and dating is good and we want you to win there. We want you to be pure. We want you to, to remain, to keep your innocence and to succeed from dating turning into marriage. We want you to win as junior high and high schoolers because life is rough. In junior high and high school, I remember. But we want you to win. We want you to win and to keep your life with Jesus up front. So we're going to look at, um, first we're going to look at the pre-dating season. The pre-dating season. This is if you are, I'm talking to you in the pre-dating season. If you are either too young to date, you're in the room and your parents say, you're too young. (laughs) You like a boy, you like a girl, and they're like, no, you're not doing that. Okay, I'm talking to you in the pre-dating season. You could also be in the pre-dating season if you just came out of a serious relationship. 
okay? And you, you need some time. This, you're, you should be in the pre-dating season. Also, if you've been married and you find yourself divorced and you haven't started dating again, you, you, you fall into the pre-dating season. There are some things we can do in the pre-dating season that are going to help us win at life and help us win at relationships. So the first thing is become the right person. I kind of like, I'm going to tell you to take notes this morning. We don't always do that, but there's going to be a lot of good things that are going to be said. So if you're not a note taker normally, that's fine. But if you want to take notes, just pull out the tithe envelope in front of you with a pen somewhere. There should be a pen. Pull it out or on your phone. I use my smartphone all the time. I use Color Note on my Samsung and I take notes. So pull out your stuff, take notes. There's going to be some good things. You're, you're going to want to take this down. So the first thing if you're in the pre-dating season is become the right person. Now, <clears throat> the modern dating scene has only existed the way it is for the last 100 years. And I'm, I'm only saying that because people have existed for thousands of years. And so if the dating season has only looked like it has for 100 years, then you need to know that's not the only way to do it. And for thousands of years, it has looked different. And I'm going to even say over the last seven years, the dating scene has changed uh, incredibly from the way that it used to be. I just have to say swipe right and swipe left, and some of you in the room know what I'm talking about, okay? Uh, the da that didn't exist 10 years ago. That, that wasn't a thing, okay? So a popular thought, and I have to just preface this, a popular thought and action among people in the pre-dating season, come on, you guys have heard this, is that you're looking for the right person. Maybe you've been there. You're looking for the right person, uh, which sounds noble, but what happens is we refuse commitment uh, because we're not sure if they're the one, but we offer sexual intimacy, okay? So we're playing the field while we're waiting for the one. And I'm talking to you if you've been called out of the world, Jesus says there's a better way to do this. Because what happens is when we play the one, or we're waiting for the one, but we play the field, things are happening in our spiritual and our emotional life that we didn't sign up for and we weren't ready for. But we're, so while we're waiting for the one, those, those desires, those things are real. Those urges are real. And so we want to act on them. But there is a season for everything. <clears throat> and not all things belong in all seasons. So right, feeling right emotion, wrong season. So um, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about people my age and younger. So I'm 30. And then there's a whole generation of people younger than me. And the popular thought of, among my generation and younger is that marriage doesn't work because we've seen so many marriages fail. We've seen parents in divorce. We've seen split families. And so what happens, I believe, is in our heart, we truly do desire relationship with someone. We desire that intimacy. We want that, we want that marriage, but we're terrified that it's not going to work. And so it's safer to play the field. It's safer just to do what my feelings tell me to do. It's safer just to do what my body is telling me to do because the one doesn't exist. So let me tell you something. If you have been called out of the world, it can work. Marriage can work. There is the one. And there's, there's a way to do that right. And so the choice you can make, instead of looking for the right person and playing the field in the meantime, choose instead to become the right person. So the choice you can make is become the right person. What do I mean by that? If there is a the one that you are hoping for, what, do, what are you hoping for in the one? Do you want them to love Jesus? If you do, then you love Jesus. You become a lover of Jesus. You follow hard after him. You become the right person. Do you want her to be dedicated and passionate? Then you become dedicated and passionate. You become the right person. Do you want him to be faithful and committed? Then you become faithful and committed. You commit yourself to becoming the right person. <clears throat> and I'll tell you this. If you commit yourself to becoming the right person in the pre-dating season, then it's going to be a whole heck of a lot easier to identify a fake who's pretending to be what you want and the genuine who really is what you've been hoping and praying for if you become the right person. Okay, so I'm going to move through these pretty fast. The second one is reach the world. So you're going to become the right person, and the second thing is you're going to reach the world. First Corinthians chapter 7, verses 32 through 35 says this. Paul is writing to people in the city of Corinth, and he says, I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. 
An unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking about how to please him. But a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. Come on, you know that's true. Uh, his interests are divided. In the same way, a woman who is no longer married or has never been married can be devoted to the Lord and holy in body and in spirit. But a married woman has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. Come on, that's true. I am saying this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few distractions as possible. Guys, you are, if you are in the predating season, either you've never been married or uh, you're divorced, you are not incomplete without a mate. Absolutely and completely, 100%. You're not incomplete without a mate. You have more freedom than your married friends. And God can use you to do far more things far more often. Come on. I'm married and I love my husband. Elliot loves Jesus more than I do. And I love that about him. He became the right person. I became the right person. And we're running in the same, in our own lanes together. And it's beautiful and it's amazing. And we have two kids. But I can't do what I used to do when I was single. Okay, I used to be able to travel the world and go all the places and do all the things. I can't do that anymore. It's not my reality. That was good for the season, but now I'm in a different season. All, there's a season for everything, but all things do not belong in all seasons. If you are not married, if you are unmatched, you are not incomplete. I've got, so I'm 30, and I've got friends who are 30, and they're single, never been married. And I'm sure that their relatives are like, got a boyfriend yet <laughs> or you know if you're a boy like why don't you have a girlfriend what's wrong with you there's nothing wrong with you absolutely nothing wrong with you not everybody needs to have a partner not everybody needs to have a mate and you are not incomplete without one if you keep your eyes on Jesus you become the right person and you reach the world Jesus will use you to do incredible things far more often and in far more places okay um, there's benefit and blessing in being single. Choose to reach the world, not to play the field, okay? Um, the dating season. Are you guys ready to move on to the dating season? I feel like this is where more people are. More people are like, man, forget that pre-dating. I'm dating. Okay, you guys are doing good, by the way, with this message. Okay, the dating season. This could also be referred to the love is blind season. Um, this is when you find that boy or girl and they just make you swoon. Like, you need to be with them every waking moment of every day and you will find time where time doesn't exist. You will stay up late, you'll leave work early, like you'll do whatever it takes. Call in sick because that person is perfect. Love is blind and they can do no wrong. This, this even happens in jobs. Like you've been looking for a new job, you get a new job, and you're like, man, this job is perfect. It's blind. It's, it's, it's beautiful. And then all of a sudden, you know, two weeks in, you're like, man, this ain't perfect. This ain't perfect. This ain't what I thought it is. The same thing happens in relationships. We're just blind for a whole lot longer because we got weird hormones and urges raging in our body, and we're like, this is good. Okay, so the first thing you need to know about the dating season is that you are blind. You're blind. You cannot trust your feelings, and you cannot trust your emotions. They will lie to you, okay? It is in the dating season, here we go. It is in this season where we are most tempted to compromise, okay? It is in this season that the enemy takes what God intended for good and uses it as a weapon to destroy you. And it won't happen in an instant. It will happen over time usually, and it won't happen on the outside. It will happen on the inside. And eventually you find yourself lost and confused and unsure, not what do you do, where do you go, who are you? God, the enemy will take in this season and use it as a weapon to destroy you. So what we want to do is we want to increase your odds. And again, I'm talking to people who have been called out of the world. There is no judgment if you haven't given your life to Jesus, and even if you have, I'm increasing your odds. I want you to win in your dating relationship. I want you to win in your marriage. I want you to win at life because God wants you to. He has a plan and a purpose that is good, and you can do this. So the first thing you need to know in the dating season is that love is blind. Your emotions and your brain will play tricks on you because of those hormones. It will be the right feeling, it will be the right emotion, and it will be the wrong season. Okay? The dating season should be a time, if you've been called out of the world, 
This is a time where you have found someone who has their eyes fixed on Jesus. They're running just as fast as you are for the right things, and you're looking over and you're like, I think this could work, okay? And so the dating season begins. The dating season is the time to find out if it really can. What do you believe about finances? What do you want for your future? How many kids do you want? How do you handle money? How do you treat people? You want to find out who they are. But love is blind. So you're not looking really at what they're doing. You're looking at them. Like, what do you look like? Okay, and how can, well, you know, you know, you know how it happens. So the trouble is, in this season, it's hard to keep your focus on the future when the urges and desires of the present are so strong. Okay, so I'm going to give you some things. This is what I'm telling you. Take notes. Uh, here are some things to help keep you on track. First, overarching theme, put parameters around your passion. Put parameters around your passion. Image, you have a fire burning and it feels good. You know what I'm talking about. But you need to keep that fire contained. A contained fire is good for the body. It brings warmth. It brings life. An uncontained fire will wreak havoc in your life and destroy you. Okay? Good fire is you're camping. And you're like, yeah, this is good. Keep me warm. I can toast my marshmallows. Bad fire. That fire catches the whole forest on fire, and now you're dead. And you, your camping experience is over. Okay? It's the same thing. Right feeling, right emotion, wrong season, okay? How do you do that? How do you put parameters around your passion? Number one, limit your talk. Limit your talk. What do I mean by that? Don't tell the person that you're dating that they are the one unless you're ready to put a ring on it, okay? And I'm mostly probably talking to, well, I'm talking to both. Men and women do the same thing. But you say things in order to get them to experience something so that they'll do something you want them to do. Limit your Talk. I'm trying to protect you guys. I'm trying to help you. You know, this is a fun fact. Uh, you remember, so bridesmaids and groomsmen, how they stand on the side? They're, they're more, they were, so in ancient Jewish times, it was more than just picture taking. Those bridesmaids, bridesmaids and those groomsmen, what they did is they fought to protect the innocence of the two people dating. They protected their relationship. They said, I want you to win. I love you. I want your marriage to succeed. And so they would have, the, the men would have swords. Like, I have fought to protect the innocence of this relationship. Whoo, that's powerful. That's more than just, hey, my, my friends, you know, stand with me and take pretty pictures with me. How about if the friends, the people you want to be your bridesmaids, were actually looking out for you, saying, girl, don't go there. Don't do that. Why don't you come out with me? Because I want you to win. Because I want you to succeed. Because I don't want you to have hurt and pain in your life. Okay? So limit your talk. Don't say things you don't mean. Don't say things out of season unless you are ready for a lifelong commitment. <clears throat> Number two, limit your time together alone. Limit your alone time together. <laughs> yeah, right. You know this. This is like, duh, but you, we just choose not to. Okay, that's fine, but do things in groups, please, people. Do things in groups. Attend a life group. We have life groups going on almost every day of the week. Get you and your dating fellow or lady into a life group and do life together. Read the Bible together. Find out about Jesus together and have those people protect you. Have those people asking questions. Uh, go to Taco Tuesday with some friends out in public. Go to your friend's house for dinner while your friend's family is home. Get to know people in groups. There's only one thing you can't do in a group. <laughs> or at least you shouldn't be doing it in a group. Come on. Come on. Right thing, wrong season. Right thing, wrong season. If you want to win, come on, people. And I know this is hard. You're hearing this, and you're like, this is good. I know all of you want to win. This is why it's called choosing the hard right over the easy wrong. There are some choices we have to make if we want the future that we hope for in our heart. Okay? Number three, limit your touch. <laughs> Very simply, just don't touch. No touchy, touchy. Keep your hands off. This is, a very, this is a very powerful statement, but, well, I'll get there. If they are the one, you're going to have plenty of time for touching. The marriage season is the longest season if you stay married. Plenty of time for touching, and that's the right season for it. But here is not the time. Here is not the season. Now, this is a powerful statement. Boys, girls, if you're out with a boy or you're out with a girl and you put your hands on them and they are not your husband or they are not your wife, then you put your hands on someone else's husband or someone else's wife. 
let me tell you something. When you finally do get married and you finally do find the one, you don't want any hands on your husband. You don't want any hands on your wife, even in the past. Why? Because there are things that happen in the spiritual realm and there are things that happen in the emotional realm and you've got to deal with it. And let me tell you, it will come up in your marriage and it will be ugly. Why? Because we don't talk about it. We have urges, we have desires, we have feelings and we don't talk about it. And so this stuff gets shoved under the surface. You want to keep your hands off in this season to help protect the people around you. What happens is when you start touching, things go too far too fast. And then you're like, how did I get here? How did I get here? So simply, here's the thing. If you're in the room and you feel like, man, I've already messed up, that's okay. That's okay because we'll help you pick up the pieces. And we want to help you pick up the pieces. We want to help you put your life back together. But if we can help prevent you from having to pick up the pieces, we want to do that too. So if you haven't gone there, take this seriously. And if you have, then come. We'll talk to you. We'll help you put the pieces back together because we love you. <clears throat> now, parents, I'm talking to parents because dating season's real. And I, so this is what I'm, if you've got a kid who's age 10 and over, they're, in, they're potentially in the dating season. And I say that because if they have a smartphone or any, any, any kind of internet access or access on any kind of phone, Things are going to happen far more quickly than you ever want them to. And here's, here's the funny thing. As parents, we put parameters around a lot of things for our kids' life. You know, we want to know who their friends are. I mean, they have to go to school. Like, we want them to win, and we know how to help them win in lots of areas. But when it, when it comes to this, it's like we don't know what to do, and so we don't know how to help them, and so we don't even talk about it. The world is talking about it. They're going to see it. They're going to ask questions or they're just going to do it. And so parents, you got to keep the lines of communication open. And it doesn't have to be super serious. You're thinking like, oh, God, I don't want to have that conversation with my kid. Keep it, keep it the way you are. However you communicate with your son or your daughter, talk about it. Daughter, I know you're really, you re you're really going to like that boy. You like him. And you're going to want him to do things. You're going to feel things that you've never felt, but stay in public. And you have permission to say no. Tell your daughter that. Tell your daughter she has permission to say no. Tell your daughter she has permission to get up and walk out. Tell your daughter she has permission to say, hey, yeah, let's, let's go out. I'd love to go out with you, but let's keep it in public. She has permission to set parameters around that relationship. Parents, you got to talk to your, your sons and tell them, yeah, that girl's real pretty, and you're going to want to touch her. But keep your hands off. Okay? I mean, come on. Your, your child isn't going to come to you and tell you that they've got these weird feelings and emotions and desires going on. They don't know what's going on. They don't know how to talk about it. You've got to initiate it. And you can keep it light. You can keep it airy. You know what I mean? But you've got to talk about it. You've got to keep the lines of communication open. Let's help protect our kids. Come on, we can do this. We can help them win. You acknowledge their feelings and their emotions, and you let them know that they are good and they are right, but this is not the season, okay? Come on, this is good. Uh, under that same dating part, you want to use family as a safeguard. Include your parents and your siblings in your dating relationship. If you feel like you don't have a good uh, blood family, Lifeline is committed to helping you win. Be in a life group and have your life group people help you in this relationship. If you're in the youth group, Pastor Daniel and Pastor Amy, they're committed to your dating relationships winning. You can confide in them. They can help you. I've got a twin brother, and we included each other in those dating relationships. If he didn't trust him, why the heck should I? Come on. Use your family. They love you. They're here to protect you. Use them as a safeguard. Have accountability software on your devices. If you've got a computer, tablet, phone, whatever it is, have accountability software on there. Why? Because it's going to eliminate the temptation. If you can eliminate temptation, do it. Why leave it there to walk in the trap that the enemy would set for you? We've got accountability software on everything that's located in this church. We've got accountability software on everything in our house, on all of our phones. Why? Because we love each other. We want to protect each other, and we want each other to win. So we are accountable. It's good. We re there are a ton of software programs out there. We, I mean, literally, we recommend Accountable to You. Accountable to You is a great software program. Runs in the background. You don't even know it's there, but it keeps you safe. So the last season we're going to move into, you guys are doing excellent, by the way. I love you. I love you guys. This is hard, but you're doing great. Uh, the last season is the marriage season, okay? By far the longest season, and uh, it's not the most tempting season, but it probably is the most difficult. 
1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5 and 6. Again, it's Paul writing to the people of Corinth. And I have to tell you that these are, he's writing to people who have come out of the world. Corinth was the most sexually promiscuous city at the time. You name it, it was happening. Like today, they're just, you know, swipe left, swipe right, do this, go there. Like, whatever you wanted, whatever whim was out there, you could find it in this city. And so what was happening is that people were giving their life to Jesus. They had been called out of the world, but they didn't know how to have healthy physical relationships. And so Paul writes them, and he's talking to married couples. He's talking to married couples. So if you're in the room and you're married, he says this, Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time, so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. Afterward, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. So this is a no-brainer, but the marriage season is the season for physical intimacy. Here, it's okay. (laughs) Touch as much as you want to. Paul, that's funny. Paul (laughs) is writing to the Corinthians about the subject of marriage. And sexual activity was out of control. Okay, so he's trying to give them some parameters. Like, wow. Um, So here we go. It's no newsflash that the desire for physical relations is strong. That desire is strong. It is real. It is good. And when marriage happens, husband and wife comes together, it's usually probably uh, fulfilled pretty often, you know, because you both are so excited about it. Uh, And so it happens pretty often. That desire, that urge, whatever, that drive gets fulfilled pretty often. But the trends seem to be that that fades over time. You know, this is true. You don't have to comment. That fades over time. We have kids. uh, We move up in our jobs. We spend more time providing for our family. uh, We we pursue other interests and other things. And so we still love each other. uh, We still talk to each other. We still live in the same house. But we don't touch as often as we used to. We don't come together as often as we used to. And the scripture says that come to, says to come together so that Satan cannot tempt you for your lack of self-control. Marriage is the season to come together. The hard right over the easy wrong is choosing to come together even when you don't feel like it. Okay? <clears throat> this is the season for embracing and for coming together. Women, when you hold that back or you pull away from your husband, he does too. What will happen is your heart, over time, sadness will begin to creep in because you no longer feel loved. Uh, Those words of praise about who you are will drift off, and instead you're maybe only ever hearing how not nice you are, how unkind you are, how different you are from how you used to be. Uh, The enemy, you can be sure, will trick you And he will highlight someone else's husband who treats his wife so much better than you get treated. And so you'll pull farther and farther away from your husband and you'll refuse more and more to come together. And the enemy will continue to trick and try and destroy that relationship. The same thing will happen with men. When that isn't happening, you can be sure that you're going to stop praising your wife. You're not going to tell her how beautiful she is. You're not going to tell her how kind she is. You're not going to thank her. The compliments and the passion you once had will fall off. And then you can be sure that the enemy will drop a pretty new complimenting women, woman in your path. Okay? The scripture says, come together so that the enemy cannot tempt you. Husbands and wives simply make the choice to come together. Wives, make the choice to praise your husband for what he does, for mowing the lawn, for changing the diaper, for working hard, for studying hard. Even, and here's the thing, (laughs) women, you're like, man, I'm not going to praise him for that because I want him home more. I don't care. Praise your husband for working hard. Why? Because he is working hard. And if you start praising him, something will happen in your heart. Those hard walls will fall off. Same thing. Husbands, tell your wife she's pretty. Tell her that she's kind, that she's compassionate. Tell her, all, tell her all the things, even if you don't think so, even if you think she's the meanest person on the planet. If you start telling her how kind she is, you notice that one thing, it will do something in your heart, and it will be easier and easier to be able to come back together like you used to so the enemy cannot destroy you. And I have to tell you that this, this, this issue isn't the number one cause for divorce, even relational problems. We're going to talk about it in a couple weeks, but it's really financial problems. But what happens is the enemy will drive a wedge and he'll get you to come apart, and then he'll use everything else to tear you apart. 
Okay, the wedge is you refuse to come together. So make the choice to come together. So at this time, I'm going to stop getting into your business. And the ushers are going to come forward, and we're going uh, to take communion together. I have to tell you that communion is not some weird occult practice uh, where we're going to drink the juice and eat the cracker. It's simply, communion is this. The, blood, the juice represents the blood of Jesus. And what that means is the blood of Jesus has made you white as new. When Jesus went to the cross and that blood was spilled, he says, I have covered you with my blood. If you feel like you've messed up in this area, please don't let the enemy tell you, well, you've messed up once, so now you just have to keep going. That's not true. That is a lie of the enemy. Jesus makes us new. So even if you feel like you've messed up, choose today to start over. Choose today to make things new because Jesus Christ has made you new and he has made this possible and he wants you to win so we're gonna we're gonna take communion as it's being passed help the ushers you know pass it quickly take the juice take the cracker uh it says this and i want us to do something together this morning because even if it's not in our romantic relationships you can be sure that this week we probably messed up somewhere we've done something wrong we had a bad thought and we acted on it whatever it was we said something rude when we knew we shouldn't have somewhere some way we messed up and so first john Uh, Chapter 1, verse 9 says this, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and he will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. What that simply means is I'm going to acknowledge the fact that I've messed up, and I'm going to offer it to Jesus because I want him to make me new. I want to do better. I want to win. I want to succeed. I want new life in Christ. And so we're going to, I'm going to have you keep your eyes open because communion is being passed. But I do want you to repeat this after me. If, if you want that in your life, if you want to confess the sin so that Jesus can come and help to make you new, go ahead and repeat after me. You can do it out loud or under your breath. But say, Father, I confess that I have sinned. I thank you that you are faithful. And I thank you that you make me new. So um, the communion is still being passed. And as it's being passed, I need you to remember this before we drink the juice and uh, eat the cracker is this, that Jesus made the choice to go to the cross so that we could be forgiven and healed. Jesus made the choice to give up his life so that we could find new life, a life free from guilt, a life free from shame, a life free from condemnation. And so if you feel like those things are going on in your heart and life this morning, what I want you to do is as we take communion, let the Lord tell you that you are new, you are free from shame, you are free from guilt, you are free from condemnation, because that is not from God. Remember in the beginning, Jesus draws people to him and he makes them feel safe and he makes them feel secure, and he makes them feel loved. So if you're in the room and those aren't the things you're feeling, then that's not Jesus. The enemy would try and keep you away from that. Jesus says, I love you, and I know that you're going to mess up, but I'm going to make you new anyway. Keep coming back. Keep coming back. Keep talking about it. Keep surrendering your life to me, and I will make you new. So go ahead this morning, Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. Father, we thank you for your son, and we remember that we are made new in Christ. Go ahead and eat the cracker and then drink the juice. Now, I want everybody to go ahead and close their eyes for the sake of everyone else around you, just so you have your own quiet time. Close your eyes. And I want to give you an opportunity to make some choices today. Maybe you knew Jesus in the past or you had a relationship with him and you've walked away from that. Uh, Maybe you have a relationship with Jesus, but uh, you want it to be better. You want it to, to be deeper. Or maybe you've never heard about Jesus or you have, but this is the first time where you feel Jesus talking to you and you want to know this person of love and security. While your eyes are closed, I want to tell you that Jesus is for you. No matter where you are at on the spectrum, Jesus is for you. Jesus loves you no matter where you are at on the spectrum. And he has a good plan for your life. And so I want to give opportunity. It would be so foolish for me to leave today and not give you an opportunity to let Jesus do what he wants to do in your life. So if you are here this morning and you want Jesus in your life, you want more of Jesus, you want to be able to make those good choices, then I want you to raise your hand because I want to celebrate with you. I see your hand. Come on, if there's more of you, raise. let's, let's do what Jesus wants us to do. I see your hands. I see your hands. 
I want you, everybody in the room, you can keep your eyes closed. I want you to, to repeat this prayer after me. It says in scripture that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then we are saved. Because it is our mouth that we confess or profess and are saved and it is with our heart that we believe and are justified or are made right. So I want you to repeat after me. Jesus, I believe you are Lord. And I believe you have been raised from the dead. Come, Lord Jesus, and make me new. Raise me to new life with you. Amen. Come on, let's open our eyes and celebrate those who have given their life to Jesus. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. And we see your hand, but what's more important is that God sees your heart and he knows what's going on and he's not going to leave you alone. He's going to come after you, and he's going to pursue you, and he's going to love you, and he's going to keep saying, son, daughter, come after me. Come after me. I love you, and I have what's best for you. So if you made a decision for Jesus today, we've got some things that will be helpful for you on your journey. The first thing is sign up to get baptized. Our next baptism is happening on May 20th. That's coming up in a couple weeks. You can sign up in the Life Center. What baptism, what baptism is is an outward uh, action to, a phys- to an inward decision. It's, it's saying, I've been raised to life with Jesus. And so we go under the water and we die to our old self and we come up out of the water and we say, yeah, I'm living life with Jesus. I'm going to win. So sign up to get baptized. That's May 20th. The next thing is to sign up for a life group. Life really is better together. And coming to church on Sunday morning is great. You hear the message, it's corporate worship, but those relationships that you need to keep you going at two in the morning when you're tempted to make a bad choice, it's gonna come from that life group. So get plugged into a life group. There's one happening almost every night of the week. You can check them out on the back wall and sign up for one of those. Get plugged in. Life is better together. And number three, join a church. We really like Lifeline. We love Lifeline. We think it's great. You're here at Lifeline. Uh, But if you've got another church or you know somebody at another church, Uh, There's a lot of good ones. Stockton, Gall, Lodi, they're everywhere. So find a church and plug in because it's when you're plugged into the body of Christ, into Christ's body, that you will become everything that God has intended for you to do. So go ahead and do all those things. Stand up with me this morning. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. Uh, So if you're ready to receive a blessing, you simply just hold out your hands because you want to receive what God has for you. If not, that's okay. If if you feel weird, that's fine. Uh, But this morning, I'm going to do the blessing from the Bible. (laughs) Moses uh, did this over the Israelites. And what he said is, if you if you do this blessing, then surely the Lord will preside over his people. And so receive this blessing this morning. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Be blessed this morning, church. Receive the blessing. Go have a great Sunday, and we'll see you next week. Yeah.